Yeah. So the first session we had was really from Fertility Network UK is a national charity that really is about supporting people going through fertility issues. And we had a lady called Anya Sizer, who was the regional coordinator um, for London at the um, charity. And she came along and spoke. And I felt it was important to hear from her um, just in terms of they're doing a lot of work about campaigning. If you've ever been through um, fertility treatment or had fertility issues, or you know someone that has, this can be a very challenging journey. And it's made more challenging by the fact that you can't get fun. Well, I say you can't, except in very, very specific cases and very few cases, I would add, can you actually get funding for this on the NHS? And it's a big problem. It's a big challenge because women are having children a lot later on life. Not a lot of people sometimes become judgmental about this. I was speaking to a friend of mine who's a doctor, coincidentally, with an interest in gynecologist in gynecology. And he was saying, oh, you know, women that, you know, maybe their careers, etc." And I think a lot of people, you know, think that, you know, but it's not choice. It's just the way I think our lives are now to some extent. And, you know, not being able to, we can control a lot of things, but we can't control when, you know, we can't control, like we said in the last session, we can't always control the seasons we're in. We just have to do the best we can in that season we find ourselves in. And so for tip, but Fertility Network is trying to do a lot of work to address those issues to do with funding, you know, because people that smoke, people that drink can get, if, you, if you're a smoker, you damage your um, liver, or you're a drinker, you damage your liver, you can get funding, you will be able to get a transplant, even though you, you know, choose to live that way. For this, that women have no control over, they can't, in most cases, get funding, and it's not a lifestyle choice. So they're doing a lot of work about that, and she spoke a bit about that, but she also spoke about some of the studies they've done, some of the data they've collected, which hopefully, and some of them, maybe some of you might find some of it a bit encouraging because the fact that you're not alone, you know, she spoke about some of the myths and reality the fact that people think it's uncommon, actually it's really common. Um, there's a lot of people and I think mm, it's rare to find someone that is 100% infertile, which I think looking at things from a positive point of view, there is always hope and nine out of 10 times there is always something that can be done. Although we can't always predict that the outcome will be what we want, but it is a common issue. Um, people think that it's mostly females, even from a cultural perspective, the woman is always blamed, which is not true. Um, we had another session later on about male fertility, but it's, it's not a female issue. Um, and it could be the men driving it as much as the woman. I had um, a patient the other day who broke down in tears when I was seeing him, a guy, and he was like, you know, not an old guy in his 30s, saying that all that... Um, they just found out that he's the cause of why they can't have a child and he's been under a lot of pressure, a lot of stress, etc. So it's not just the female issue. Then some people, like I said, think that it's a lifestyle choice that people don't want to have children or, you know, women don't want to have children or don't want to meet a partner, which is far from the truth. Yes, a lot of women might not want to, you know, compromise maybe in the way they saw other people compromise and stay in bad marriages or go in bad relationships just so they can tick that box um, and treatment always work unfortunately treatment doesn't always work in fact in terms of if you compare it with other treatment it's not the odds are not great you know you know however I would say on the positive side we are getting better and the odds are improving for a lot of people so she also touched on the emotional impact, the fact that, you know, the toll it can have on your mental health and well-being. This is why I personally think the spiritual aspect is really important because that will help you, you know, in terms of mentally getting through this and reducing the potential emotional impact it can have. That can be a negative, even in terms of you having a successful um, conception. And then having to take time off work the pressure it can put on your relationship and finance issues. It's a, like I said, you don't get funding for this. So it is a significant cost. Um, there are cases of people having to sell their houses to be able to fund treatment, you know, et cetera. 
So they do a lot of campaigning and they, you know, she gave some tips about supporting yourself through the journey. She also shared her personal story. She um, had a child. I think she had two children through fertility treatment, if I'm not mistaken, but she also adopted. So I was quite interested in learning from her about her journey in terms of adoption and what she thought, because I've always thought that adop adoption is an option. And she was saying that from her perspective, she thinks that people should remember that adoption isn't necessarily about you. Adoption is more about the child and being able to give a child a home. Um, so it's important that people realize that adoption is always an option that I feel isn't often considered, whether, I mean, the mystery patient we had was saying how she was open to adoption, but her husband wasn't. Um, partly because of where he was, maybe it might be different now, she was saying, but she, he wasn't, you know, but she was. So, and, you know, from a cultural perspective, it's not that, but it is an option, but I think it's important to realize, and I see it as an act of service as well. And sometimes there have been cases where people have adopted and they've been blessed with a child. And I think she was just emphasizing the fact that if someone is going to go that route, to think really hard about it, because it's not just about you fulfilling your desire to have a child. It's also about making sure you can cater to a child, you can bless a child with a home, and you're willing to go the distance, um, such that if you do end up having other children or you've got other children before, that child is not going to be disadvantaged. Um, but I think it's important to think about that as well. So if you, in case you want to know more about them, you want to support them in their campaigns, or you just want to tap into some support that they might be able to give you, knowing that they've dealt with this and deal with a wide variety of people, those are their details, uh, fertilitynetworkuk.org. Um, and like I said, if you've got any further questions about that, you can stop me as we go. And she basically set up the session very nicely for myself. And I wanted to speak about an alternative approach to infertility and which I think applies whether you're trying for the natural route or whether you're going through treatment, wherever you are. And just to give you a bit of background about myself. So like I said at the beginning, I currently work, um, I come, currently work, wear about four hats, which I'm trying to condense a bit. So one is primary care network where I work across a few GP practices and do a variety of tasks from managing their medicines to seeing patients, to triaging, a bit of a general, as you would expect in general practice, especially with long-term diseases. Um, and I used to work in hospital as a clinical pharmacist before I sort of moved down the public health route. I also do some work as what we call an advanced clinical practitioner, which is <laughs> the NHS trying to get us to do two jobs for one. So the advanced clinical practitioner is almost like a mid-level doctor um, role. That's basically what it is. It is very medical. And then I, I do that. Um, and then it's, you know, but I still have to work as a pharmacist. So it's kind of two jobs for one. So I do a bit of that because that's where the NHS is going and I have no choice. And I run my own pharmacy which I started off the back of the NGO stuff where I do stuff both here and abroad in Africa. I organize sporting events. I use sports as a tool um, to, you know, impact the health and social well-being of um, young girls and the communities we basically do events in. And then I do a lot of health stuff in the UK and things like what you're attending today. And the pharmacy is a way of us trying to sustain our activities um, by continuing to do what we do, but also trying to raise money to do what we do in the community. So that's who I am. The interest in fertility started from my interest in integrative medicine, which is a bit like saying holistic medicines, where I have an interest in like herbal medicine, supplements and long-term conditions and really helping people achieve specific goals by taking a more holistic approach than just saying, have a tablet, off you go. Um, so it's a bit more than that. Um, and, you know, when I moved to general practice, starting to deal a lot more with general stuff and having quite a few people with fertility issues or women wanting to have children in their 40s um, and late 30s is kind of what 
you know, made me to start learning and digging deeper into this um, and also reflecting on my own journey as a person. So that's a bit of background about who I am and where I'm coming from. So, right, so the key takeaways for the session I gave was the fact that color matters. So unfortunately, if you look like me or if you're the same color as me, you are at a disadvantage today in the UK in terms of you know, fertility treatment, fertility challenges. And I explained um, in my session why that's the case. Some of it is stuff that we don't have much control about. Some of it is to do with policies. We also don't tend to engage much in clinical trials as much as other people do or other races do. So sometimes the data may not necessarily apply directly to us. And I gave a good example, which is very common, which I'm sure lots of people have heard about, but I still see a lot of an issue with in practice, and that's vitamin D. Um, the standard dose, what Public Health England recommend is applied, to, you know, they give it, you know, Public Health England and the NHS works on a public health perspective. So they kind of do something that fits the majority. Where you don't fall into the majority, sometimes that can be a disadvantage. Most times the dose that's um, recommended, vitamin D, is often lower than I think people should be taking. And I use myself as an example. I consider myself relatively healthy. Um, I had to do a check and I told them to check my vitamin D. That was a bit of a fight in itself. But I was like, oh, I had to remind them, yes, I'm black. I think there's a justification to check it. They checked it. It came back a little bit on the low side. I was a standard dose. I took it. When I was doing another checkup, my level had moved, not enough in my opinion, I had to increase the dose. Still wasn't enough. In the end, I had to take five times the recommended dose. I wouldn't suggest anyone else do this, but I had to do this based on my knowledge. But it just goes to show you because we need more than the average next person because of the way our body processes. So these are some of the things that I think can be dealt with, but aren't necessarily dealt with in practice because people just deal with everyone from a general perspective. Now, in terms of fertility treatment, one of the challenges I said, and I have to be honest, is that I think sometimes because we're so reliant on the church, and most times pastors, just a gentle reminder to everyone on, just remember to mute yourself when you come on. <laughs> yeah, just remember to mute yourself thank you so um yeah like i a lot of times in church they will say to women oh don't worry just wait on god god's gonna do it and not a lot more that's kind of where the conversation ends and so what 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 the data shows is that most black people start fertility treatment later than other races and this is one of the reasons why it's a bit more challenging. So I kind of touched on all that and tried to touch on it in a practical way, but I don't believe I'm a prophet of doom. And I try to be, um, I try to look at both sides. If there's a negative, I feel there must be a positive and there must be a way of counteracting that negative. And in spite of all that, I feel we're living in great times because compared to 10, 20 years ago, we are, you know, the rate at which this field is developing is really, it's, things are really developing and giving us more and more options. And fortunately enough, things are becoming a bit more acceptable. So the stigma is still there, but not as much. So things are getting better. So it's definitely not over. And we're seeing that the odds are definitely improving for older women. What we're seeing nowadays is that, so this back in the day, sort of the 80s, 90s, when fertility treatment was just starting, those rates that they had then where, you know, if you were over 40, that was probably it. We're now seeing similar rates for people over 40. So it just goes to show that things are improving. We're even seeing breakthroughs in people over 50, et cetera. Not common, but the odds are improving. So that's the good news. The other thing is that there are things that can be done to increase your odds of success. And in some cases, most times if you go to a clinic, that's what they're selling. So they will tell you, okay, IVF, okay, you know, fertility treatment. But there's a lot of cases that I believe that you don't even need to go down that route. If, with a, if you focus really hard, and I spoke about that, 
there isn't necessarily evidence for specific supplements apart from things like your folic acid, your vitamin D, your iron, but there is information coming out to support some of those other supplements. However, the evidence is very, um, very debatable, but what there is a consensus of opinion about amongst you know, health experts, amongst obstetricians and fertility experts is that there is value in tailored bespoke health programs. And I set up a program as well, which I run for my pharmacy based on some of the knowledge that I've been able to learn, some of the people that I've gone on the journey with, et cetera, where, you know, it's bespoke. So we try to tailor it to your specific situation, look at your blood, advise you on blood, not something I make money from, but in some cases, there are some bloods that you can only get privately. Um, we can help organize that. We do individualized research. So when it comes to supplements, even the medications, if you happen to have to go down the fertility treatment route, we can help you mitigate some of the side effects because they're really strong doses for like a short period. So obviously you've got risk of side effects, et cetera. And then lifestyle and really helping you to achieve your goal. So I kind of spoke about all those things. So there's a lot I feel you could probably take away from that session. And that was kind of, you know, what we covered there. So again, like I said, if you want to cut in at any point to ask a question or to add something, then please feel free to do so. Right, so the final bit of this section was male infertility. Um, and that was delivered by Professor Frank Chinengundo, who's um, also an MB. He really is an amazing person. He's one of these people, like I said to you, all of the speakers, the logistics, you know, all of the speakers were really excellent when it comes to this, not because I've said, but they're really people that are the top of their field. They know their stuff. Professor is like internationally renowned, um, not just within the UK, but internationally. He's a urology consultant, the lead consultant at Bart's Health, which is the biggest trust in the country. Um, I used to work there, but I met him after and he was like, oh, you know, how come we never met when we were there? But he's always someone that whenever I approach, he's always willing to partake. This time he delivers a session about male infertility, which is one of his areas of expertise. So he really touched on a lot. And like I said earlier, he spoke about the fact that, um, he touched on the fact that although it's less known and oftentimes the focus is on the woman, but he really highlighted the fact that men are often responsible for 30% of infertility cases um, in couples, I guess, that, that in majority of cases. So it is an area that there needs to be more awareness, probably a little bit more focus on. And I know Anya from Fertility Network UK did touch on the fact that they are now trying to actively do more awareness campaigns to engage with men a lot more because there isn't much out there for men um, going through this journey. Um, like I said, I had that guy in clinic who was in his 30s, mid 30s and just broke down. You know, he came in happy, happy, you know, was saying about complaining about something else. It was only because I dug a bit deeper, I found out, and then we got to the root of his problem, which was to do with the fact that he'd just been told that basically he has no sperm, he can't, you know, produce. So they're having to look at other options. Um, and that's, I feel, is a challenge because there aren't a lot of places men can go. Um, so anyway, he spoke about the need to optimize sperm. And I've kind of tried to summarize it with that word, optimization because although people talk a lot about having a low sperm count or low quality of sperm, even if you have a low count or a low quality of sperm, it's not a definite no-no that you can't because like they say, you men would have millions of sperms per ejaculation and all you need is just one um, to make it. You know, So it's about, but it is still about optimizing the health because if it's the wrong shape, you know, we count, motility, shape, all those things come into play. And that's where having a good diet, having a good lifestyle, getting onto a good health program can make a difference. Um, it's not just the woman that needs to be thinking about improving her health, her lifestyle, um, and having a tailored plan. 
Um, but especially if you're a couple, it's different if you're getting a donor sperm, but especially if you're a couple, it's really important to carry the man along. And it's really important as a man not to think it's just a woman's problem. You also have a responsibility to make sure that you're doing everything you can. Um, and then he spoke about examinations. At what point should you be thinking about asking for further investigations? Generally speaking, we say if you've been trying for up to a year without success, then you should be looking deeper. I think nowadays we generally say if you're over the age of 35 or in your late 30s, then you might want to, after six months, you might want to just check yourself and make sure everything's in touch. And although it's not encouraged for men to do that, I personally think it's a good idea for men to do that as well. Um, just it's, it's just good to do it sooner rather than later. So and if you're a couple, I think it's a lot more helpful.